Father, we just really want to thank you for all your goodness, kindness, faithfulness to us through the week. We just so often take for granted the things that you do for us, your provision, your protection, your great deep blessings of joy and peace and hope. And Father, before we do anything else this morning, help us in this great, great calling of just coming and worshiping you and saying thank you. Help us to do that, we pray. In Jesus' precious, precious name. Amen.
the Lord and his strength fills the temple I see the Lord and he is high
Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Let's just bow our heads again. Oh, Lord, we just thank you for the incredible privilege to gather here and know that you are tangibly with us here. We thank you that we are your sheep. We thank you that we hear your voice. We thank you, Lord, that only you bring truth and revelation. Only you can go where the soul and spirit meets in our lives. And we come here this morning in anticipation and we we pray that you will speak to us. We ask that our hearts will be soft to receive ears wide open to hear. And we pray above everything else that you will take your glory. For we ask it, Father, in the name, the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, and our soon and coming King. Amen and amen. I don't have to tell you that obviously the really good news for all of us is the fact that the real church, there is a real church, and that the real church is alive and exceedingly well at the moment. Whether you believe it or not, there is a real church, it is alive, it is exceedingly well, and it is not to be confused with uh, man's temples that you see all around the place, and certainly not to be confused with the television set. Not with none of those things. The real church is alive and well. God is God. He is the only God. There are no other gods. There is only one God, and we know him through his son, Jesus Christ. He is the only God, and we really need to believe that. We say, yes, he is, but bottom line is you really need to believe it in this world that we live in. There is only one God, and that God is our almighty God, Father of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's all. And God has not lost control for one single second. Not one single second. Everything is on track. You don't have to doubt anything. Everything is on track, and God is absolutely and utterly meticulous in everything he does. And we need to believe that. We can shake our heads and say, oh, we agree with it, but you really need to take it further than that. In this day and age, you need to believe it with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. We also know that God said, my kingdom is not of this world. Now you have to believe that too. It is not of this world. You cannot see the kingdom over there. It's not over there. And it's certainly not on your TV sets. My kingdom is not of this world. I am not of this world, said the Lord Jesus. They are like me. They are not of this world, but they are mine and they are my sheep. Nothing, nothing should be more reassuring to you than that. And the fact too that, that Jesus said, I will build my church. I will build my church. I don't need you to build my church. I will build my church. And you can believe that, and he will build his church. And he said that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Shall not. There's no chance of the gates of hell prevailing against it. I will build my church. Believe it. And here again, we need 
to move our faith into that direction. We know these things, but we've got to start believing these things. And we need to know, too, that the church is built on the spirit that revealed to Peter that Jesus is the Christ. It's built on the spirit, the revelationary spirit that told Peter that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Christ. To understand who the Christ is, is very important for all of us. And it is only possible by the Holy Spirit. You cannot sit down and analyze Christ intellectually. You will not understand. It's built on the Spirit that revealed to Peter, you are the Christ. He said to him, you didn't know that God has told you that by the Holy Spirit. It's all built by the Holy Spirit. It's not built on Peter. And we must understand that that is what has happened out there. We took Peter and made him the first pope. And we do that all the time. We build it on man. We take man where God has moved in someone's life or someone's ministry. We take the man. It's God. It's always God. And it's always the Spirit of God. It was not built on Peter. It's spiritual. It's not intellectual. And it's not physical. It moves through there, but it is not my kingdom is not of this world. You know, when we look at the early church and we look at the early church and we say, oh, we would love to go back to that. Do you know the great advantage that the early church had? God was still in control. In those early days, God was all still in control. They didn't know what tomorrow was going to bring until they started to take over God's church. The great advantage of the early church was that God, by His Spirit, was actually in charge. He was in charge. These prophecies, Jeremiah 31 to 34, he said, Behold, now he's talking about the new covenant. The new covenant is coming. But he said, Behold, the days are coming. This is the covenant. This is the covenant, says God. I will write my law on their hearts and their minds. I will be their God and they will be my people. I will be, I will write my law on their hearts. I will teach them. They don't need anybody else to teach them. I will teach them. I am all sufficient in myself. I will be their God. They will be my people, thanks to me. And this profound thing, he said, they shall all know me. They shall know me. Sure. Now that is a profound statement. They shall know me. When my spirit is in them, I teach them and they know me. If they don't know me, my spirit is not in there. Jeremiah also said, I will give them, this is speaking, uh, God speaking again. He said, I will give them one heart. He's talking about his people and I'll give them one way that they may fear me forever for the good of them and their children after them. I, by my spirit, I will give them one heart. They'll have one heart. 
They will have one, my sheep will have one heart and one way. And they will fear me forever. If the fear of God is not in me, I'm not a sheep. And everlasting, I'll put my fear in their hearts so that they will not depart from me. And they will understand that fear isn't about rules and regulations. Fear all has to do with the sovereignty and the awesomeness of Almighty God. We, in so many ways, we have undermined the awesomeness of God in this day and age. Everybody, even the church, we have undermined. Through Jeremiah, he also said, Call to me, and I will answer you. By my spirit, when you call to me, I will answer you. And I will show you great and mighty things that you do not know. And we look at that prophecy and modernly we interpret it that that's all about signs and wonders because we're so obsessed with that and the devil has wallowed in that sort of self-centered obsession that we have. But... To understand, call to me and I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things you do not know. Those great and mighty, there's nothing greater and mightier than God revealing himself to you. Amen. That is the main issue. The revelation, he the revelation of himself to you. You will know me. Nobody else will have to have anything to do with that, you will know me, and you will know that you know in your knower that you know me. There won't be any doubt. Through Jeremiah, he also said, don't glory in wisdom. Stop it. Don't glory in might. Stop it. Don't glory in power. Stop it. Don't glory in riches. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Glory in this, that you understand and know me. Not that you understand about or know about me, that you actually understand me and you know me. And because the Spirit is in you, you will, you will know you will know that I am the Lord. They won't have to tell you every week that I am the Lord. You will know that I am the Lord by the Spirit, because only the Spirit can reveal that to you. You will know that I am the Lord. And you will know me, not just know about me. You will know me. And you will know that you know. And there won't be any doubt. And it will be the guiding factor of your life. You will know me. And it's all Holy Spirit fruit. You will know me. The gospel. Paul said the gospel. The gospel is the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified. We've made all sorts of other gospels, but he says the gospel is the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified. The revelation of really knowing who Jesus was, what the Christ is, what is the Messiah, and the whole relevance of everything that happened over that weekend. You will understand and not have to be sort of cajoled into it, into understanding that the Easter weekend is the greatest weekend in the man's calendar. 
when you celebrate what happened, and you will understand what happened. Jesus said in, in his prayer in John 17, he said to the Father, he said, they will know the gospel. And the, the gospel is that they will know you and me. Again, same thing. You, they will know you and me. They will know who we are. They will know the relationship. They won't question it. They will know you and me. The Spirit will reveal it to them. Outside the Spirit, you're not going to understand. You are not going to understand just how profound this all is. It's life changing, it's mind boggling, but it changes your life. My sheep hear my voice. My sheep hear my voice. They're not going to follow the other shepherds. My sheep hear your vo my voice. And they are sheep. They're always sheep. They don't get promoted. They're sheep. I must decrease. He must increase, said John the Baptist. I can't even tie his shoelaces. Now that's the curtain raiser. <laughs> to, I want to just look and just show you something. I want to show you out of the book of Revelation. I want to show you there. Revelation, the early part of Revelation, it deals with the seven churches. The seven churches are representative, some people say they're representative of a cross-section of the church or they're representative of the church down the ages, whatever. But you look at that, those seven churches, and as I look at it, I see that the seven churches really are a review of man's attempt to build the church. It shows you as you look at them all. It shows you a review because there's, there's only one that gets commended and that's a small little church that just praised Jesus, the one in Philadelphia. The rest, they all got criticized in one way or another. It was, it was a review of man's attempt. And all the worldly intrusions that came to man as he attempted to build the church. Lord, give us a prophetic message. We're always after a prophetic message. We're desperate. But there is a problem. Hard hearts and deaf ears don't hear prophetic messages. They don't. Hard hearts and deaf ears don't hear prophetic messages. They don't receive them. They don't understand them. We want air-tickling news all the time. And in the modern day and age, spiritual discernment is woefully lacking. It is woefully lacking. And so we are subject to a lot of Deception. The Bible does promise us they have end time deception and apostasy. And sure enough, you look around now, it's all over the place. It's actually quite exciting because you sense that the end is near. We have deception worldwide, and it has reached gigantic proportions proportions so we understand that the time is near. Hallelujah. Anyway, we always like to turn to Revelation, always the proof. And we need to understand that 
The Revelation message is, uh, it, it might be dealing with over the years and that, but it's always as fresh as the morning dew in one, rev one three virtualization. It says, blessed if you read it, blessed if you hear it and receive it and keep the words of this prophecy. Read it and believe it. So we got to seven churches, and if we look at those seven churches, we look at them as churches down the ages. So number seven, the last one, that's the church now, the church of the end time. Let us just read, just listen to these words. Let me read to you what it says. In the book of Revelation, chapter 3, from verse 14, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write this, I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Now, that's a statement. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Important to understand that's the response and that's Jesus speaking. That's Jesus speaking. And then he says, because you say, because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. You say, I am rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing, and do not know, you do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. This is Jesus speaking about the end time, church. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and I chasten. Therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The end time church, the Laodicean church, the seventh church, John's gospel is always dealing with, 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 with sevens, seven witnesses we've got here, seven miracles, seven I am, seven. The, the, the seven is very special, but as we look at Laodicea, it is all in red. It's Jesus speaking and this is the church of the final showdown, the final shutdown. He says first, he says, I know your works. Now, 
he is almighty God. He knows everything that happens with every single one of us. He is an awesome God that knows everything that you do and everything that you think. Please understand, I know you better than you know yourself. And that includes everybody here. When are you going to understand, I am the God, that God, an awesome God, I understand I understand and I know that you're doing good things socially and maybe even politically. I know that you are humanitarians. I know that you are supplying and caring for widows and orphans. I know, I know that you are receiving praise for the things you do. You're receiving acknowledgement for the things you do, even from the world. You're getting that. But nobody's good. When are you going to understand how many times the Holy Spirit will never tell you you any good because uh, that nobody is good. Nobody. Jesus berated the rich young ruler. Nobody's good, he said. So feeling good about good is not good. Feeling good about good is not good. It spawns pride and, and humanism. Good works are misrepresented. They really are. Good minus God equals naught. I've shown you this many times. G-O-O-D minus G-O-D equals naught. Some divine mathematics for you. Naught. Christianity is not a fruit of good works. Rather, works are a fruit of the Holy Spirit and Lordship in your life. It starts with the Holy Spirit. And all the important issue is not what you do, is where you are. And it's that that dictates what the fruits will be. You see, it's intellectually subtle. And the devil loves that. But spiritually, it's night and day. And spiritual things night and day with the world are night and day. They are. And we need to understand that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. I know you. I know you better than you know yourselves. I know your true heart condition. I know the motivation of you. You can't fool me. You can't use me. Don't think you can come and use me. Don't think you can uh, manipulate me. Don't think you can manipulate me with Scripture. You can't do that. I am an awesome almighty God. But you are neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. You can find all sorts of reasons for being lukewarm. Even the Bible says, because the increase of evil, many's hearts have grown cold, but you are lukewarm. And he says that categorically, and it's a real problem. It's so repulsive that it induces Jesus to vomit him. I will spit you out of my mouth. I will spew you out. Those are strong words. But we don't want to hear strong words from Jesus. We don't associate Jesus with strong words. They are strong words of conviction and authority. When Paul stood up in Athens and he spoke to the leaders of the world, of the then world, he says, you're worshipping an ungold, uh, unknown God. He says, 
God doesn't live in temples. He doesn't need you and me. In Him, we live and move and have our being. When? You see, we know those scripture, but when are you going to just believe it and live it and really understand it? It's real. The stark reality that comes from what Jesus says. His repugnance and disapproval. It's almost better to be a pagan on the outside than passive and apathetic in the church. Because somehow it's not compatible. The revelation on lukewarm. You know... As I travel around, so many people, and I'm talking about leaders, they tell me that they're really battling to put him number one in their lives. If you're battling to put Jesus number one in your life, my friend, you've never met him. I'm sorry. You've never met him. Peter, when, when, when he was restored, he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Peter, do you love me more than anything else in the world? I am that God. Because only when you love me more than anything else in the world can you feed my sheep. It's all about me. It comes from me. It emanates me. In you, you will know me. You will know me. Battling to put the pearl of great price. Once you've found the pearl of great price, all else pales into insignificance by comparison. That is the way it is to meet Jesus. Lukewarm is horrific. Backsliding. Losing your first love. It's serious. It's not like the annual flu. We somehow think that all this stuff is, is sort of covered by the umbrella of God's endless cheap grace. It's not. Psalm 19 And there David is talking about a thing that he feared. Presumption. He didn't want to presume things. He didn't want to take God for granted. He didn't want to be fitting him in or trying to fit him in. Now, the, the, the bottom line is that you can't take him for granted and you can't fit him in. But attitudinally, you can be in that place. Presumption. What is presumption? Presumption is a form of self-confidence which makes self-righteous, overconfident, triumphalistic assumptions concerning one's importance and rights as a believer. A form of self-confidence which makes self-righteous, overconfident, triumphalistic assumptions concerning one's importance and rights as a believer. It is an unacceptable arrogance in lives that should be characterized by humility. You cannot use God in any shape or form. He is God. Obedient subservience. Obey my voice and I will be your God. Sure. He says that because you say so, I think that's profoundly interesting. Because you say so, we live in a day and age of 
uh, um, uh, statements. Name it and claim it. Because you say so, it doesn't mean it is so. Just because you say so doesn't mean it is so. And how profound and disturbing. We may say so, but it doesn't mean that it is so. Lies and exaggerations are somehow considered okay if they are camouflaged or laundered in faith. They're not true. Many faith claims are just not true. They are false representations. Healings and miracles, and, 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 and miracles, they are biblical, and you need to pray for those things. Pray for them, expect them. But lies and exaggerations are an absolute abomination. Even worse, when they veiled in faith, Because you say so, and they say there, they look warm. I, I, I just love this where it says, lukewarm and loving it. They look warm and loving it because you're happy with what's going on. You look warm and happy. You do not know. And that is the great problem that you have. You do not know that you are spiritually ignorant. You lack teaching. You are uninformed. As you grope and you grapple with the kingdom of darkness and the God of this age. In truth, you are in deception. You say you are rich and wealthy and blessed. But you misguided in denial. You don't know what you're saying. You're deceived. Oh, yes. Lukewarm and loving it. Deception. End time deception. Even signs and wonders to fool the elite. It's a sort of antichrist conditioning. We're looking for people, we're looking for signs and wonders and miracles. Show us this, show us this, Lord. We want signs and we want... And they always wanted food and they always wanted signs and the miracles, but whenever Jesus wanted to speak some truth, they ran. We don't want to get anywhere near the truth. Wretched, miserable... Poor, blind, and naked. Sure, that, that's Jesus in red. Go and check it, it's in all the translations. That's laying it on the line, and, and Jesus did lay it on the line. I once heard a guy preach a wonderful sermon on Jesus, the rock of offense. I'll spew you out my mouth, you'll vomit you out, you'll lose your candlestick, name blotted out. The devil listens to all this and he says, surely not, as he did in the Garden of Eden. What you need. You know... Jesus is God's plan. There are no other plans or options. Jesus is God's plan. There are no other plans and options. Do not allow yourself to get confused in any shape or form. Jesus Christ is the Lord and one day every knee shall bow and tongue confess that he is the Lord. But believe it. Please start believing it. It's no good just being doctrine in the Bible. 
You need to appropriate it. So that's the truth laid out, and there's always, as always, whenever the word, there's a prophetic word, that's the truth, but there, there, there are solutions. There is a solution. And he said, what you need, desperately and urgently, God always gives options a way out. You need refined gold. Not the glitzy stuff you've made. You need true, pure, refined gold that comes from the furnace. You have not been refined in that fire. Job, when I'm tried, I shall come forth as gold. That's the gold of God's refining. And there's no refining, sadly, because there's no preaching of sin and repentance, no cross, just cheap grace. I'm sorry. That's the truth out there. So you need refined gold, you need white garments. And what would that suggest? Purity and holiness and righteousness. God is awesome, God is sovereign, God is to be feared. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Obedience to God's word, self-effacing humility. These should be the discernible traits and the fruits of the Holy Spirit in you. When the Holy Spirit is in you, my friend, your life will change. If there's no change, there's no Jesus. I'm sorry. There's a world out there presenting you sort of options and imitations. You will know me. If you're born again, you will know me. And he said, those I love I rebuke and I chasten. I'm in the admonishment business. God is not a doting father. God doesn't soft soap. The Holy Spirit never tells us how good we are. Flattery, mutual admiration societies are the devil's work. Hebrews 12.5 My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves and punishes everyone he accepts as his son. Preaching a tolerant God and cheap grace doesn't lead anyone to conviction on sin and righteousness and repentance. It just doesn't happen. Judgment begins in the house of God. Be zealous. Be zealous. God requires passion and zeal because that is a fruit. I want to tell you that during the 1980s, things were going on in South Africa. There was a passion. There was an excitement. People were coming to breakfast. People were getting saved. Things were happening. Today, where is it? What's happened? Where's the passion? Where's the zeal? And the passion and zeal is not so much in good works, but in your desire to seek me and find me with all your heart in the secret place. Psalm 91. Repentance is a key issue. Turn 180 degrees. Repentance is that. It's not remorse. It's not a pity party. I think it's so profound there in 
when God says, if my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn. Now that's, that's quoted often. We have a men's meeting or a men's weekend. Sure, just look at that. If my people, and he's starting with those who profess to be mine. If my people directly call by my name, again assuring us that he's dealing with my people. And if my people will humble themselves, they will pray something they haven't been doing for a long, long time. They will seek my face and they will turn from their wicked ways. They will do all those things. And I want to tell you those, those things are not possible without the Holy Spirit. Then I will hear your prayers. He says, Behold, I stand and I knock. Interesting. Outside the church in Laodicea. I'm still outside. Hear my voice, open up. He who has an ear, let him hear. It's not a corporate thing. He who has an ear, it's interesting that with the seven churches, whenever God speaks to them, there's a general message, but the, the challenge is individual because it starts like that. It's not a corporate decision. This whole issue starts with you, where you are. Where do you stand? And more and more so, we need to be challenged now. We are in exciting times. Terrifying times. As he said, to Abagog, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. I'm standing outside. I'm excluded. I'm bypassed. I'm compromised. Stop editing my words. Stop it. Stop apologizing for me. I am the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about a physical church. There's a real church. And my sheep are in that church. And they hear my voice. The author Greg Hennett, he said, Undisputably, Jesus depicts a church engrossed and obsessed with the present world. Given to moral compromise, deceived, smugly and arrogantly self-satisfied, but sadly a sickening disappointment to Jesus Christ. Overcomers. Oswald Chambers says, life without war is impossible in the natural and supernatural realm. Life without war is impossible in the natural and supernatural realm. It's a continuing struggle in the spiritual areas. It's not flesh and blood, it's principalities and powers. The natural and the spiritual are in constant conflict. It's a clear message, simple, but a very challenging message. You see, we know, we know most of these things, we know it. But move into it, implement it in your life. 
Laodicea. Friends, Laodicea is here. It's, it's looking you in the face in the world today. I'm not saying here. It's looking you in the face. It's staring us darkly in the face. Can you hear the trumpet? Can you see what's going on? The twig is budding and summer is near. There's a visible church. The real kingdom is within that visible church. And that is the sheep with the listening ears that are in there. But the visible church is not the real kingdom. The visible church is not the real kingdom. It's you and Jesus Christ. It's as simple as that. He is all sufficient in himself. He is all, and friends, we need to believe that. There's a revelation involved in that just as much as there is a revelation in truly understanding that the gospel is the revelation of Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the gospel, not church problems and church politics. That's got nothing to do with the gospel. That is the gospel. And where do you stand with the gospel right now? Friends, we need, believers or not, sheep or not, we need to be challenged regularly on these issues. The church needs to challenge us regularly on these issues. There's a massive deception going on. And it's only going to get worse. Where do you stand with Jesus right now? Let's bow our heads. Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for this, this opportunity and privilege to share your word. And Lord, I know that we are unworthy and our words are mere babblings, except that you would take those words and you would minister profoundly. And I pray that this morning, in your very special way, I pray that hearts have been soft. And in your special way, I pray that you have found something in this message for each person to challenge them where they are sitting. And I pray that there has been a response in that heart, deep down in that heart. And that lives will be challenged never to be the same again. I pray that many will leave here this morning determined never to be the same again. Take your glory, Lord, for I ask this in the name that is above every other name, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.